Another thing that I've heard is that kneeling before the Christmas tree is, is tantamount to pagan worship. How do you respond to, to those types of claims? I mean, by that logic, I mean, when Israel sacrificed animals, they were doing pagan worship because they're doing the same thing the pagans did. While Christmas is not part of our Jewish calendar, Messianic Judaism affirms Christians celebrating Christmas as a time of honoring Jesus' birth and incarnation. As Rabbi Dr. Joel Lieberman says, the attack against Christmas does not come from any of the mainstream Messianic Jewish organizations, not the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations in America, the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America, Tikkun America, or the Messianic Jewish congregations in Israel, Ukraine, Russia, and South America. Where does it come from? It comes from Gentiles who are embracing their interpretation of a return to Jewish roots. Today, there are influential and growing Hebrew Roots YouTube channels spreading the myth that Christmas is pagan. This is not only damaging to perpetuate this view of Christmas, but more importantly, it's not true. And today, we're interviewing the director of Inspiring Philosophy, Michael Jones, to help us navigate the scriptural, logical, and historical issues related to the claim that Christmas is pagan. And the timestamp for each question is in the description below. Enjoy the conversation. Michael Jones, thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, thank you for having me. So before we get into kind of the, the meat of, of our content today, I just kind of want to start out by asking you, what was your position before doing this research about Christmas and kind of where did you come out on, on the other side? So, yeah, I started researching this maybe like a decade ago. And at the time, I, I probably, oh, I did think Christmas had pagan origins. In fact, I, I, everyone knew it did. So, I mean, like, why would like the History Channel lie to us kind of mentality is what I had. And so like, but my, I was dealing with a lot of fundamentalist Christians that were saying like, well, because it has a pagan origin, we can't celebrate it. Because when you put presents under a tree or you bring a pine tree into your home, you're setting up a pagan idol. And I was like, that's just silly. That, that's not how religion works. Like it's more about intent and what you're thinking and this kind of stuff. So I was like, let me do a video or some videos on this and just show like, even though it has a pagan origin, it doesn't mean it's wrong for us to celebrate because we don't, we're not setting up idols. We're just making decorations and they mean different things now. But as I started researching it, I kept coming up, coming to the conclusion, there's not a lot of paganism here. So I kind of like, it started like to erode that belief away. Like for a while I was like, okay, well, the date wasn't pagan and Christmas trees aren't pagan, but surely mistletoe and Yule logs are. And then I researched that and those didn't turn out to be pagan either. So my position before this was, yeah, it's pagan, but so what? Then after researching this, I was like, wow, there really isn't a lot of good evidence for paganism in Christmas, surprisingly. Wow. Okay. So what sources did you go to that helped bring you to that conclusion? Well, there was a bunch. I mean, for one, The Origins of the Liturgical Year by Thomas Taley was a good one. I remember reading a book by Ronald Hutton, who's not a Christian, called Stations of the Sun. And he was sort of writing it to because he's he kind of identifies as a pagan, uh, so he was trying to find some understandings of ancient paganism, and he ended up writing a book on a lot of Christian traditions like Christmas, Easter, Halloween, where they come from, and so that's his book, The Stations of the Sun. Also, a great resource was the Dictionary of English Folklore uh, by Simpson and Road, uh, Encyclopedia of Christmas by Tanya Gulovich and Stephen Hidgmans, who's a scholar on Roman sun worship, wrote a paper called Sol Invictus, the Winter Solstice and the Origins of Christmas. That's where I sort of went for initial sources. And then I went even beyond that and started looking at primary sources and just didn't find any evidence. Hmm. Yeah. So you, earlier you mentioned the importance of intention when it comes to religious worship. And that reminded me of a discussion that you had on Capturing Christianity's channel, where you spoke with a pagan uh, named Ocean. And even he was explicitly talking about how it's intention that really matters when it comes to approaching these sorts of things. When, when it comes to this claim that, that some Christians are making of accidentally honoring some pagan deity, that goes against what we pagans are talking about when we uh, do active worship, um, because it has to do with the intention of 
making an offering to that said deity. There's a lot of, uh, there's pagan practices involving sacrifice and prayer that are very specific as far as their uh, progression of naming the deity, uh, going forward with uh, honoring what it represents and then making your request um, as far as honoring, as, as far as like the act of worship involved. Decorating a pine tree doesn't do that. Decorating a pine tree in your house is not a, it's not even close to that because you aren't naming the God. You're not making the request of the God and you're not honoring the God in, the, in any way whatsoever other than doing a practice that maybe is somewhat related to uh, some of the practices that go on beforehand. So, you know, as far as the anti-holiday crowd within Christianity that you're talking about, I don't, I don't really see their point. Just to hear that even from the pagan community, that there's this nuance that, that needs to be had is, is super fascinating. Yeah, I think that's obvious because ancient pagans sacrificed animals to their gods. So did Israel. But it was about the intention, not just the mere act of killing an animal on an altar. It was about what they, was behind the intention. Who were they sacrificing to? What was their purpose? Yeah. So when the anti-Christmas crowd uses the term pagan, uh, what do they typically mean by that? It's not well-defined. Typically, they mean any sort of ancient polytheistic or modern religion. They're not going to lump in like Islam or Judaism with that, but they would say Hinduism, ancient Roman pantheon, the ancient Greek religion, North religion, these types of things. It, it's, it tends to be anything that is not Christian that was sort of worshiping like a polytheistic pantheon. It tends to be what they mean by it. But there's variation in that because it's not a well-defined term in this debate. Gotcha. So we want to go over like different areas of um, in this discussion. And the first one is scripture. So the key text that I, I keep on seeing pop up when the anti-Christmas crowd uh, says, you know, Christmas trees are pagan and all that um, is Jeremiah 10 verse two through four to start out. Uh, so what's going on in that chapter? And like, how is the anti-Christmas crowd reading it that uh, I guess you would disagree with? Yeah, this has been used on me by Jehovah Witnesses even. Like Jehovah Witnesses pulled this verse out because they don't celebrate holidays. And basically it, it's – Jeremiah is talking in ancient Israel, and he's talking about things that pagans do. And he says, learn not the way of the nations, for the custom of the people are for vanity. A tree from the forest is cut down and work with an axe by the hands of a craftsman. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with a hammer and nail so that it cannot move. And then they tend to stop there. And if you just read that, it, it does kind of sound like a Christmas tree. It's cut down, it's decorated, and it's fastened in a place so that they can't move. The only problem is, is if you read any scholar who's written anything on this passage, any scholarly commentary on Jeremiah, no one says this is about Christmas trees. They know it's about crafting idols from wood. And it's pretty clear because verse 5 picks up and says their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. They cannot speak. They have to be carried, for they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. So when it says in verse 3 that it's worked by the hands of a craftsman, it's talking about them taking the wood and actually fashioning a little idol about it. This is why Jeremiah says they cannot speak or walk because they're, they're fashioned to have legs and a mouth and everything. So it's, it's not an actual Christmas tree. It's about crafting idols from wood, which happen in the ancient world a lot. Jeremiah directly says this. But I think a lot of the you know anti-Christmas crowd, they, they'll just take that first part and they'll go, aha, see, but you need to go beyond that. You need to actually look and see what the scholars are saying on it. You need to read beyond verse four. So that's one of the ways they sort of abuse that verse. And like, even if they were right, <laughs> ancient pagans were cutting down pine trees and decorating them to honor their pagan gods. So what? That's not what modern Christians are doing. It's a decoration. You know, it, it's like in, here in Arizona, sometimes people do Christmas cacti, cacti. They'll decorate a cactus in Christmas fashion. Well, let's say we found out some ancient first peoples were decorating cacti in, to, sort, to celebrate some sort of winter festival. That wouldn't mean that's what Christians were doing. It, it would be something entirely different. Their motive would be, for the ancients, would be worship. The motive today is just decoration. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, especially reading it in context. Like by itself, it does seem like it's talking about a standing tree, but then the mouth and can't speak, can't walk. That really does. 
An another text that's brought up is Isaiah 44, verse 14 through 15. Um, so what do you think about this and the claim that it's condemning Christmas trees? Yeah, once again, it's about, it's about idol worship. Like, like he cuts down cedars and chooses a cypress tree or an oak and lets it grow among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for a man. He takes part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire with it. So he cuts it down and turns it into firewood. And he, with the remaining wood, it says he makes a god and worships it. He makes an idol. This is a lot less, a lot more obvious than Jeremiah 10, that it's obviously about him cutting down a tree, using part of it for firewood, and using the rest of it to make an idol. It has nothing to do with Christmas trees, but yeah, they'll use this verse in conjunction with Jeremiah 10 at times. What about Jeremiah 3.13, which I've heard used uh, in order to condemn the giving of gifts being placed underneath the tree? What do you think of that passage? Yeah, it's talking about them casting their favors under every green tree. Again, scholarly commentaries do not think this is about placing gifts under a pine tree or any sort of tree. It's, it's about idols that were placed under trees. You know, we're, we're talking about the Middle East where it's very hot. If you're going to worship an idol, you'd like to be somewhere cool. So these are often placed in cool areas, like under trees, if you're out in the wilderness and you want an idol. So it talks about them casting their favors under every green tree because they're going under these trees to worship pagan deities. And that's a problem. You know, if you're going to just, with all these verses in general, if you're just going to pick the verses you want uh, and say, you, you know, this sounds sort of like a Christmas tree. I can do the same because Isaiah 41, 19 to 20 says, like, I will set in the desert, the cypress, the plain and the pine together. And they may see and know, may consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. So in this passage, God directly says that the pine tree is supposed to be a symbol for him. So why can't I just say the Christmas tree comes from this if we're just going to pick the verses we want that could vaguely sound like Christmas and draw conclusions that um conclusions that are probably a stretch. Right, right. That makes yeah. So like looking at the logic of this even more so, um, about the logic of the anti-Christmas perspective, um, if the anti-Christmas logic holds up, what are other things that we should give up because they're apparently pagan? Oh, wedding rings. I mean, yeah. we should give up. I mean, wedding rings go back to ancient Egypt. Uh, circumcision goes back to ancient Egypt before uh, Abraham even existed, like hundreds of years. Uh, we should give up the entire chapter of Acts 17, because in Acts 17, Paul says, for example, you know, as some of your own poets have said, in him we live and move and have our being. We are his offspring. So he directly is quoting pagan poems, applying them to the God of Israel and saying, this is what they, you know, this is what this is really about. So we should throw that out. I mean, there's so much we should throw out that we that the anti-Christmas crowd isn't going to do because it would just, they'd have, you know, they were actually you know, intellectually consistent on this. They'd have to give up so many things to go back to paganism. And, you know, if you, some of them go so far as to say like things of the, like, you know, pagans worship trees. Therefore, you can't even decorate a tree because it's doing what the pagans did. Well, if we, we can't do anything a pagan ever did, you got to stop, you know, you got to stop everything you're basically doing because pagans would pray is praying wrong pagans had uh holy texts at times can christians not have holy texts they sacrifice to their gods was it wrong for israel to sacrifice like it just doesn't logically work so it, it uh, just on the bare logic of it they're not consistent across the board yeah it seems like a lot of it has to do with like really low resolution perception of these different objects uh, so I've heard you mention in, in other videos about this that there's six-pointed stars found in ancient Egypt. And so they may point to the Star of David on the uh, flag uh, for Israel and say, oh, see, look, another six-pointed star. So there's all these pagan connections and, and defilement. But it seems yeah, like I having that kind of low-resolution view kind of enables them to lump all this stuff together. Yeah, same thing with like the line of the tribe of Judah, who's Christ. Well, there are lion deities. There's an ancient Egyptian war deity that, that was a lioness. I mean, there's lions used in all sorts of Mesopotamian uh, uh, depictions and whatnot. So what? So it sounds like we're, we're kind of answering the next question I had, but what if Christmas does have these, these pagan roots? Is abandoning it uh, the right response for, for Christians? Well, no, and that's not even scriptural. I mean, remember what Paul said in like 1 Corinthians about the Lord's Supper. Like the, the, the Corinthians had corrupted it. They turned it into like some sort of pagan 
a feast and whatnot. And he says, he doesn't say, well, now we got to get rid of the whole because you've ruined it. Like we, got, he says, you know, get back to the roots of what's really important here. You know, what's really important is we're honoring Christ. So that's what it should be about. So even if Christmas did have pagan roots, the actual focus that Christians have is to honor the incarnation of Christ. So that's what we should focus on. And we should get back to that as the, the basis for why we celebrate Christmas. Yeah, I read that passage in, in Paul in particular in 1 Corinthians, and I almost get the feeling that if if the traditions that kind of uh, became accumulated and associated with Christmas did have pagan roots or pagan connections, that he would actually be rejoicing that it transformed into a holiday that honors uh, the Messiah. And so I think that's a important point of of drawing that conclusion from Paul. And so I think I think that is an important passage to point to. And so what do you think causes the anti-Christmas crowd to take such a dramatic leap in uh, their logical process here? Legalism. I mean, I think that's the simplest explanation. It, it's it, a mentality that I want to be holier than thou art. I'm, I'm separating myself from the world in all these extra ways to really show you how much I love Jesus. It, it's dangerous. It's, they're not actually being more holy. It, it's, and I, I think that's generally the mentality we get with a lot of people today. It's like, I'm going to be so holy that I'm going to avoid all these worldly things because they may have connections to paganism to show you how much I really am dedicated to Christ. But I mean, if you actually understood the gospel, you, Jesus doesn't care about that. <laughs> like, you think really Jesus is up in heaven really worried about people decorating pine trees? I think there's some more important things on his mind. <laughs> that he want, you know, like Maybe we should worry about loving one another more and keeping it the commandments he actually gave us, not worried about traditions that we may add on top of that that we think are going to make us more holy so now like moving to the history um just the history of, of the issue uh what is the origin what is the origin of the myth that chris is pagan like what's what's this origin story why, why, so, why have we gotten here today essentially so it tends to come from thinkers a couple hundred years ago protestant movements sort of separating themselves from catholicism because catholicism had become corrupt and then making the inference that maybe Christmas as well had pagan traditions. It picked up a lot. It picked up in the 19th century when archaeology is getting going. People are starting to look at the ancient Near East more, looking at ancient texts more. And so there was this idea that maybe some of the holidays we have go back to these pagan roots and whatnot. So you had various groups or writers over the past couple hundred years trying to say that Christmas has a pagan origin. But, you know, they were sort of just making conjectures based on the limited data that they had. And, you know, it wasn't all Protestants. There were, I mean, Martin Luther and John Calvin, for, for example, did not claim this, this idea that, you know, we should just abandon Christmas. You know, so it, it depended on the certain group that was sort of making that argument. Yeah, I found it interesting to, to hear about the history of the Protestants, I guess protests against Christmas uh, earlier on. And so I'm curious, when did Protestants come to accept Christmas as their own and, and why was it all of a sudden deemed okay? Well, the Protestants weren't one big group. Uh, there they were, they were different sects. So like, you know, John Calvin wanted to, you know, he celebrated Christmas so he wanted to honor the nativity. Same with Martin Luther. They did not sort of abandon Christmas and whatnot. Uh, there, but groups like the Puritans, for example, did because they thought it went back to paganism and it should be just rejected entirely. Uh, so it did, really depended on the group. I mean, early, going back to Martin Luther and John Calvin, they embraced Christmas and some later Protestants didn't. Uh, so it's, but that's the same kind of mentality we have today. We have some fundamentalist evangelicals that reject Christmas because they think it's pagan. But the majority don't, don't really seem to be on that board. Most just accept it and celebrate the holiday, set up Christmas trees remember the nativity, these types of things. So, you know, it, it was depending on the group, really. Puritans definitely rejected it, but Lutherans did not. Now, that's a good clarification that Protestant is not a, a monolithic group. <laughs> and so I'm curious, I want to read a quotation that a very popular Hebrew Roots channel called Unlearn the Lies, uh, Lex Meyer, he quotes this uh, from a Charles Spurgeon sermon in in lex's video where he's arguing against christmas and stuff like that and so I, i'll read charles's uh spurgeon's quote and I, i'm curious to hear your thoughts on it so it says 
We have no superstitious regard for times and seasons. Certainly, we do not believe in the present ecclesiastical arrangement called Christmas. First, because we do not believe in the Mass at all, but abhor it, whether it be said or sung in Latin or in English. And secondly, because we find no scriptural warrant what, whatever for observing any day as the birthday of the Savior, and consequently, its observance is a superstition because not of divine authority. So th there's a lot to unpack there. For, for one, Charles Spurgeon is not really the expert on the origins of Christmas. To give you like an analogy, like St. Jerome, for example, said that Buddha was born of a virgin. Well, he was wrong. He what Buddha was not born of a virgin, especially in the earliest sources. He's just so far divorced from Buddhism, and he's writing about something for which he doesn't have a lot of data on. Uh, Spurgeon, for example, is not going to be the expert on this. The actual historians that have looked into the primary sources would be. It, but yeah, the argument that he does make that it's not, you know, sort of set up in scripture, to me, it is. It's bad reasoning. I mean, by that logic, you can't do anything. It's not set up in scripture. You can't use the internet. I mean, you can't read Charles Spurgeon. Like, why? You should only be reading the Bible then, by that logic. Uh, and you know, because you know, th there's just so many leaps in logic from just quoting some you know, some guy from a hundred years ago or so, or roughly that that time, to say that this somehow can't be celebrated. For one. The Bible also never says you cannot set up certain days to honor things about God. Like It never says you can never do this. You can take a pretty good analogy from the book of Esther. They set up the festival of Purim. Well, God never, does ever, never comes along and says, yes, do this festival. It's great. No, he, they just sort of set it up to honor what happened. So you can take the sort of reasoning from that and say, why can't we set up right days to honor the resurrection, to honor the incarnation, to honor other things like the 4th of July. Like, is it wrong to set up a day to honor American independence just because the Bible doesn't allow us to do that or doesn't directly say you can do that? There's just a lot of like, when you start taking that type of reasoning and applying it else, elsewhere and to different things, it starts to really break down. So I, I don't know how quoting Spurgeon sort of helps their case. Why don't we quote historians on the actual origin of Christmas? Right, right. Yeah. Whenever I hear the, the counter argument that, oh, Christmas isn't in the Bible, I like to point out, I think it's in John 10, where Jesus is going to Jerusalem uh, during Hanukkah and the Feast of Dedication, which is not a biblical holiday, right? And so even Jesus was celebrating a, a non-biblical holiday. Correct. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So going to the, the date of Christmas, December 25th, right? Um, it's always brought up, or at least it's a lot of times brought up that it's Saturnalia. This is the same date that Saturnalia was celebrated. So uh from your study of the primary sources and, and scholarship, uh, what's is this is this accurate? No, it's just not. There, there's no evidence Saturnalia was ever on December 25th. So an early author, Macrobius, writes that in book one of Saturnalia. So he wrote books on Saturnalia. In the first book, he says uh, it was on the, the 17th, December 17th, and it lasted for three days. Based on some Roman fast inscriptions, it may have lasted up to seven days in the early Republic. But it's, if you do the math, you get including the 17th, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. So it may have gone to the 23rd. But the Macrobi sort of gives the impression that it was really only celebrated on the 17th and that people, you know, kind of got back to work, that kind of mentality. Uh, so no, it was never celebrated on December 25th. And there are no ancient texts that say Christmas was some sort of conscious takeover of Saturnalia. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. So what about Sol Invictus? That's, that's a lot of times brought up. Even I heard in a recent video by Rabbi Tovia Singer, uh, a, Jew, a counter missionary, uh, thinks that Sol Invictus is uh, December 25th. So yes and no. See, Singer's not giving you all the details on it because he's not looked into it that much. Uh, I've given the benefit of the doubt. He just hasn't looked into it that much. Um, Sol Invictus may have been on December 25th, but not until after Constantine. So the only source that mentions Sol Invictus on December 25th is something called the Philokalian calendar, which dates to 354 AD. But also, it doesn't actually say Sol Invictus. In the calendar, it just says 30 games were ordered for the unconquered one, which is weird because in other places, it does mention Sol festivals and directly says Sol. 
So why doesn't it mention there for the 25th? That's a weird thing. Now, like I agree with most scholars, it probably is like an indirect reference to Sol Invictus. It's just not as clear. But that's the only source that mentions Sol Invictus. It, uh, there's no sources before this that say there was anything on December 25th. So people try to bring up the Emperor Aurelian. But the philo calendar says that he honored the sun with chariot races every four years in October. Fast inscriptions mention sun worship, festivals like December 8th, sometimes in October, sometimes in August, but they never mentioned the 25th. So there, there's just no evidence there was a holiday prior to Constantine that, uh, that was celebrated on December 25th. And we know that Christians were celebrating December, on December 25th long before Constantine. A point you made in another video, you talked about how the Hebrew Bible scholar Richard Hess uh, says that Jewish festivals fall, fall, fell on uh, pagan holidays. Could you, could you elaborate more on that? Yeah, so he talks about this in his book, Israelite Religions. So, and he's using this to argue that the parts of the Pentateuch go back to like the end of the late Bronze Age. So he's arguing for like a maximalist position, which is something we should embrace. Uh, we know there was a city called Emmer that had certain festivals uh, in the fall and in the springtime around Israel's festivals. Uh, and, and they did a lot of the same similar type of rituals like anointing with blood and oil, uh, festivals around harvesting and uh, the, the grain festival and all this types of stuff. And he argues there was probably cultic competition uh, sort of going on in there. Like the Israel did not want uh, the Israelites to go and worship with these pagans on their festival so they had their own festivals around the same time it, it was real cultic competition like you need to worship the god of israel so we're going to make sure our festivals are sort of positioned around these dates so that you're not tempted to go worship these other pagan festivals and he brings up uh texts like emmer 369 emmer i think it's four four six and there's another one as well that talk about these uh issues that sort of say it looked like the biblical feasts were sort of cultic competition with these festivals at Emmer at the end of the late Bronze Age. Yeah, it seems like the Antichristus crowd would just be having the exact opposite logic that the, the Bible is giving right there. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So is there any pagan holiday that falls on December 25th or that, that, that we know of? Not before 354 AD. There's no evidence right. of it. I'm not saying there wasn't. I'm saying there's just no evidence of it. Okay. Mithra was not born on December 25th. No sources mention that before Encyclopedia Britannica, because like they still have that on their website. Uh, you know, that, that myth start, starts to come up in like the 19th century uh, from people who just didn't know any better. Uh, there's no winter solstice festivals. This is another big myth that ancient pagans were obsessed with the winter solstice and had festivals on it because the Julian calendar places the winter solstice on December 25th. But I mean, scholars like Ronald Hutton note, they just, didn't care. They treated the winter solstice like we do. Like it was just a celestial event and nothing more. So we have no evidence that ancient pagans really cared that much about the winter solstice and had festivals to honor it or celebrate it or whatnot. So why was 1225 chosen by the church? The main reason seems to be is because they actually thought that was the day Jesus was born. They were obsessed with calculations and looking for signs and whatnot. And they had this odd belief that a prophet would die on the same day he was conceived. And they, based on their math, they calculated that Jesus died on March 25th. So he would have had to have been conceived on that day because he was a prophet. And he had to be a perfect man. Just count forward nine months and you get December 25th. So that seems to be the reasoning. That's what the early Christians are talking about in like St. Augustine and other uh, early church fathers as well. They're really focused on that as the reasoning. It has nothing to do with any sort of pagan festival. And also, just to add to this, pagans had a lot of festivals. Like, the Greeks had festivals, the Romans had festivals, the Egyptians had festivals, the Norse had festivals, the Celts had festivals. It's just ironic that they managed to pick a day for which we have no evidence of any pagan festival on, given the vast amount that there were out there. They just happened to pick December 25th, and there wasn't any pagan festival on that day. I mean, kind of... It's kind of interesting to think about it like that. Yeah, yeah, that is wild. Do you have an opinion on whether 1225 is uh, an accurate date? Because I hear a bunch of different dates thrown out there as to when uh, Jesus was born. So I'm curious what, what your opinion is. 
my opinion is is that baby i i don't really care honestly it's like one of those things like i've seen some catholic apologists really argue for the december 25th date like really go into like what Zachariah was doing at this time when it was announced the birth of John and when uh, his wife conceived and when Mary would have to have conceived. And there are interesting cases for that. There's interesting cases for other dates. At the end of the day, we don't know. The gospel or gospel authors didn't think it was important enough to tell us. Like the day was not important. What was important was what happened. And that's what we need to celebrate. Right, right. Yeah, and so in Messianic Judaism, we tend to celebrate uh, Jesus's birth and incarnation during Sukkot, where in John 1, it says that Jesus tabernacled among us. And then then there's also the people who make the argument that may, maybe the fall is when he was more likely uh, to be born. But yeah, I think that's an important point that at the end, end of the day, it's just good to acknowledge and celebrate. And even if it's not on the precise, accurate date, like that's okay. Yeah, and so yeah. I'm, I'm curious. I have, no, I have no problem with that. I mean, the Greek Orthodox Church does it on January 6th. Fine you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So when was 1225 chosen by the church? That That's a good question. We're not entirely sure. There, there's one manuscript of Hippolytus of Rome who says it was on December 25th and he's writing at the end of the, of this 200s, or I'm sorry, at the beginning of the 200s around that time. So beginning of like the third century. There, the problem is there's other manuscripts that don't mention that date. So maybe, maybe not. Thomas uh, Taylor has a pretty good argument that there was a heretical group called the, Don the Donatists, I believe is what they were called, and they split from the church in 311 AD, and they held to all feasts that were set up before that, but they didn't keep feasts that came later, like the Feast of the Epiphany, but they also celebrated Christmas on December 25th, so that implies before 311 AD, Christmas was already being celebrated on December 25th, and most historians I've seen accept that that at least by the beginning of the 4th century, sometime around 300 AD, Christians, at least a large majority of them, were celebrating Christmas on December 25th. Some, so maybe sometime between Hippolytus, writing at the beginning of the 300s, to the end of the 300s, that seems to be when that date seems to be pretty well set. Roger. So when it comes to the Christmas tree, what's the earliest uh, source when it comes to, like, what's the origin of that story? Yeah, that that's... There's a lot of different stories on where that comes from. There's one story that a, a saint, and I believe the seventh century AD, named Saint Boniface, he cut. He was um, heard about some person who's going to be sacrificed under an oak tree to Odin, so he went and cut down the tree. And when he wasn't struck by lightning, all the pagans converted, and then he pointed to the fir tree as a symbol of Christ that sort of grew in its place. Uh, so we, we're not sure that really happened. Uh, another legend attributed this to Martin Luther, you know, father of Protestantism. Uh, that's another possibility. Uh, my the one I tend to hold to tends to come that Tanya Golovich points out there. Then I think this is the most likely. It comes from th something called the Paradise Tree. So in the Middle Ages, they were obsessed with doing biblical plays, and they would do an Adam and Eve play on December twenty fourth because that was their saint day, that was their feast day. So they would do, and of course, you're in the middle of winter in like Germany, Northern Europe. There's not a lot of trees available except fir trees, pine trees. So they'd use one of those, and they'd decorate it with apples or whatever they had available. But, you know, you don't let food go to waste. And so after, on Christmas Eve or the morning after, you would, could gather around the tree and eat the apples or, you know, cakes that were on it. And so you just see that it probably sort of morphed from a paradise tree to Christmas and became associated with that. Now, that has a biblical origin, and it seems the most likely given the cultural context from which it arose. The first, and we think it probably arose maybe in the late 1400s, because our first mentions of it come from like the 1500s. Like there's an Alsace, an Alsace ordinance in France that mentions like the amount of Christmas trees a town can have and the size is what they can have. And that's in 1570, 1561. So that, that's when we first start hearing of Christmas trees. Prior to that, we don't have any sources. Now, the, the ordinance does sort of mention them as already like a custom that's already been happening for a while because it's like, you know, we need to tone down the Christmas trees. There's too many of them, guys. So it seems like it would already have been growing for maybe 100 years or so. If you're, of course, I'm speculating because we don't really know, but that's when we first start to see the mention of them. Another thing that I've heard is that kneeling before the Christmas tree is, is tantamount to pagan worship. How do you respond to, to those types of claims? I mean, by that logic, I mean, when Israel sacrificed animals, they were doing pagan worship. 
because they're doing the same thing the pagans did. I, I mean, we don't really have any evidence that ancient pagans like knelt before trees and put gifts under them. The closest thing I can find is that at one, at one point, St. Martin, uh, sometime in I think the third or fourth century, uh, went was going to go into a, a pagan grove and cut down a sacred pine tree that was there. That was it. But he doesn't, no one associates it with the winter solstice or any sort of winter celebration. He uh, doesn't associate it with, it's just, it just so, some sort of sacred grove there and he wanted to cut it down, this kind of thing. But I mean, but just because pagans may have used trees, I mean, they obviously use trees in their pagan worship or in pagan rituals or whatnot. That doesn't mean that that's what Christians are doing. You know, as I quoted earlier, Isaiah 41, for example, says that these trees are a symbol of God. So why can't we just refer to that? When I set up a pine tree or a Christmas tree, it's a symbol to Yahweh based on Isaiah 41. I'm not doing what the pagan's doing. I'm doing what God or what Isaiah talked about when he said, that, you know, God says these trees are a symbol of him. I mean, like there, when I debated Zach Bauer on New to Torah, he uses the exact argument that, you know, you're bowing to a fir tree. And I pointed out that, well, when you lean over a toilet and throw up in it, are you bowing to the toilet? And, you know, I, ironically enough, there in Japan, there are toilet gods. So are oh, wow. you worshiping a <laughs> Japanese toilet god when you have to throw up? I mean, it's let's do okay. jump to these legalistic conclusions because you have a holier than thou mentality mm -hmm. that's funny that actually reminds me of uh now it's that's a very relevant passage to the discussion but in in the mishnah so early rabbinic literature probably second third century ce there's this account of a rabbi who would he would visit a, a bathhouse in in rome and so there's uh there's kind of idols set up all around kind of decorating the bathhouse and so he's you know enjoying the bathhouse and there's a a non-jewish person who actually questions him like how can you do this when there's when there's pagan statues set up around and he brings it back to this conversation about intention and he says that these statues are being set up as decoration not for idol worship and actually, one of his arguments that that's the case is that I know it's just for decoration and not for idol worship because it's, been, it's the statue of Aphrodite is set up on the sewage pipes and people are peeing in front of it. <laughs> so he's like, so it's okay. So I can, I can do my thing. And the, the kind of conclusion that is, is reached there, let me bring this up. So here's from Mishnah Avodah Zarah 3.4. It says, a statue that people treat as a deity is forbidden, but one that people do not treat with the respect that is due to a deity is permitted. So even in the context of an actual idol of Aphrodite, it's the intention that matters. So how much less so when it's something natural like a tree? Um, and then, yeah, kind of the bathroom analogy is fitting there. Yeah, that's, a, so. that's a great analogy. It absolutely fits it perfectly question i want to ask also is um i think it was zach bauer or other hebrew roots teachers who brought this up or bring this up and that's the the carol oh christmas tree oh christmas tree um what what, what do you think about that is like pointing to this as like a patent worship of the tree i mean really like, you're yeah. just singing about a tree it, like it's not saying oh christmas tree oh christmas tree grant me my wishes for you are you know the creator of the heavens and the earth like <laughs> What is it actually saying? Like, are you that legalistic? You can't think. You can't think beyond, like someone just talking about how they decorated a Christmas tree. Yep. Like, you know, these people don't think. They just, they just, they just jump to these legalistic conclusions and think, "Well, I got to be holier than thou mentality." Come on, just use some reason here. We're called to use reason. Isaiah Absol said it in chapter one. Absolutely. Uh, so moving now to uh, Santa Claus. Um, so before the pagan stuff, do you have any issues with the Santa Claus practice? Yeah, I absolutely do. Uh, like last night, I was talking to my daughter who's six now, and she is convinced Santa is real. And I told her flat out, well, honey, Santa's not really just a character. Like, I'm not going to lie to her. But it, she, she's stubborn. She's like, nope, he's real. I know it. Okay, well, what can I do? Oh, I'm not going to like, you know, force her to think that way. But I mean, as she gets older, she'll grow out of it, but I'm not going to lie to her ever. I don't agree with people's telling their kids that Santa is real. Uh, you know, just, he's a character we, we use at Christmas. I don't also agree with the focus on how he's become very materialistic. Uh, 
It's all about him bringing gifts. I wish Christians would sort of minimize gifts. And so we're doing in my house this idea where we do, we give her one thing she wants, one thing she needs, one thing to read, uh, and one thing to give away. So it's trying to teach her more of a mentality that it's not about gifts. It, it's more about Christ. It's more about the fact that he came. And we're, gonna, we're trying to, hard to put more of a focus on that and less on gifts. Because Christmas has become some sort of celebration of materialism. And we need to stop that and we need to get back to what's really important with Christmas. And so that's also about trying to reclaim Santa Claus and repurpose him in a better way. That's really good because I guess there's even – uh, fighting against the secular intentions that are imposed upon Christmas uh, as well. So exactly. uh, now kind of going, returning to the, the pagan roots is Santa Claus. Does, is there any derivation from pagan gods uh, with the character of Santa Claus? No, <laughs> everyone tries to connect him to Odin uh, or Joel Uh No, there, there's just no evidence of that. Santa is St. Nicholas. Uh, the Dutch after they became Protestants, still honored St. Nicholas because he was a gift-giving saint that cared about children. And they called him Sinterklaas. So Sinterklaas, Santa Claus, see the kind of connection there. Uh, in the 19th century, the early 19th century, Christmas was a drunken festival. It was like a Mardi Gras. And there was a lot of people who wanted Christmas, especially in America, to become a more family-centered holiday. So some Dutchmen in New York were trying to connect with her roots. And they celebrated the Feast of St. Nicholas on December 7th. Well, the gift-giving saint traditions were moved to December 25th. He was redressed from a, to not look like a Catholic saint because they were very anti-Catholic in this day and age. And he was dressed in the traditional attire of a Dutchman, which was a big red suit in New York at the time. So they revitalized him, added him to Christmas. And they just there was this big 19th century revitalization of Christmas. Let's get it away from a Mardi Gras type thing. More family-centered holiday. Gift giving was done on New Year's between adults, and that was sort of dying out. It sort of moved at they moved after Christmas as well. After that, Santa was sort of exported around the world, and he was taken to Finland. He was taken to Germany. He just became very popular in Finland, for example, in the 1920s. A radio broadcaster named uh, Marcus Rurio. I can't remember how to pronounce his last name, but it starts with an R. He took Santa and he sort of combined him with this pagan deity called Jolapuki. And sort of just made a Santa version of him there. So Santa's origin is Christian in origin, but then he was sort of in like going to Finland or Norway, sort of like amalgamized with pagan deities. So now people think it, the opposite is true, that Santa came from those pagan deities, but it was actually the opposite. Is that Santa was Christian and sort of then sort of like combined with paganism in various cultures. So another um, Greek god that I hear specifically i heard this from uh a person who claims to be a messianic teacher monte judah uh that it's basically poseidon or king neptune and so like he sees the parallels of king neptune's chariot being pulled in the ocean and now santa claus pulls the chair so he sees the dutch point and says the origin of all this goes back to king neptune and poseidon santa claus is actually king neptune of the greeks he's actually poseidon of the Romans. Uh, if you go and get an imagery of who King Neptune is, you're looking at Santa Claus. Instead of riding on a sleigh, he's riding on a chariot, uh, you know, in the seas, you know, with fish pulling him along. <laughs> like you're really fishing there, man. No oh, pun yeah. intended. <laughs> but yeah, it's like chariots were used in the ancient world by a lot of deities like like so what like every, people use chariots by that logic i can say that santa is really a reworking of ramesses the second because he used a chariot <laughs> like are we really going to do that like, yeah. that's how people got around i mean before cars and, and in the 19th century they didn't have cars either they rode on horses or they rode in carriages or or when they were going through the sleigh they would be on like you know a sleigh like what santa actually rides on mm -hmm. you know, it kind of looks like a chariot yeah. like so what do you expect them to use like i mean well, let, let's let, like if you're going to like work on the Santa, uh, the, the Santa you know, culture and whatnot. Well, we can't connect him to chariots because pagans use those. We can't use sleighs because pagans use that. Let's have him ride on like I don't know, a three-headed wolf. Nope, we can't do that because you know the Greeks had that. Like, are they get do they have to go through and like pick everything and like make sure it's nothing is pagan? Like, okay, he didn't ride on a. Uh, we'll have him ride on a dolphin because no pagan deities rode on dolphins. Like. Probably could find a, a pagan deity riding on, on a dolphin somewhere in Polynesia, somewhere or whatnot. But I mean, like, 
the logic behind this is just absurd. You're just trying to find any connection you can that could possibly be there and running wild with it. What's the best candidate in your mind that Santa is derived from a particular pagan god? Like, is there any that's even in the realm of possibility that you'd be willing to grant? When you do the history, no, because it's clear that it's Saint Nicholas. It's Saint Nick. I mean, that's just the end of the story. It, it, Santa Claus is Saint Nicholas. The closest you can get is Joel Apuki, because again, there was a merger happening there in the 1920s in Finland. But, you know, so now Joel Apuki, if you Google Joel Apuki, you're going to get all these Santa looking figures. But if you go back prior to that, Joel Apuki looks nothing like Santa. So that, that's going to be your best candidate. And, I, and pagans have to try to use that as, to make a connection. But there, there's just no evidence of it. Again, if you're going to actually follow the paper trail, it goes back to St. Nicholas. All right. So I really want to get your reaction to this. Uh, there's this guy, he claims to be messianic. I mentioned before, Monte Judah. And um, just the confidence he gives in this statement about the idolatry of, of Christmas. Uh, I just want to see uh, what your response is, given all what we've gone over in this, in this interview. So you can, let's press play. Christmas, American Christmas, is probably the strongest shining example if you were trying to do a basic biblical definition on what is idolatry and how does idolatry work? How does it deceive? How does it persuade? How do people get caught up in idolatry? For crying out loud, who in their right mind would say, I'm just going to believe in false, a whole ton of false things? Well, there has to be something very attractive, something deceiving about it, something that lures you into it. American Christmas is the most shining example of idolatry that's ever been created by man in the history of the world. Yeah, I, I'd like to comment on that, a lot of that. Uh, for one thing, it's yes and no. People have turned Christmas into a materialistic holiday where they worship themselves and they worship gifts and they worship money and they worship all sorts of things in materialism and that needs to stop. But just like with First Corinthians and the Lord's Supper, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's keep Christmas for what it is to want to be incarnation and get rid of the materialism. Absolutely. So I do agree with him on that. Uh, but the idea that it's pagan, it, it, it's just nonsense. It doesn't go back to Poseidon. It doesn't go back to any of this stuff. It's just modern man trying to turn, take a Christian holiday and turn it into a materialistic holiday. But I mean, if, if you're going to say that it goes back to it's somehow idol worship, I need to see some evidence of that. Like when I when people decorate a pine tree, I don't see them kneeling before it and praying to it for gifts. If they were doing that, he'd probably have a pretty good point. But I mean, like, but no one is doing it. It's a decoration. I mean, like when he he's got when he decorates his his church or wherever he uh, preaches at, is that setting up pagan idols? I mean, I see I have plants behind him. Pagans worship plants. They worship nature. Does that mean those plants are pagan idols by that logic? No, of course not. And he would say that that's not what they are. Well, yeah, same same logic applies to Christmas trees. All right, so now let's talk about wreaths. I've heard it claimed that wreaths uh, derive from paganism, so Christians shouldn't use wreath to, to decorate their home. So what's your opinion on, on that? Do wreaths derive from pagan practices? Yes and no. I mean, it derives from just traditional decoratings that humans have done in cultures around the world. We have wedding wreaths. We have funeral wreaths. We have Easter wreaths. We have Memorial Day wreaths. I mean, people just make wreaths because they're a common decoration people make. So it's like wedding rings. A lot of cultures do wedding rings. So what? It, it doesn't mean it goes back to some sort of pagan custom. We have no evidence of a wreath being associated with some sort of pagan winter solstice festival. Uh, and again, for Christians, it's just a common decoration. I'm not really even sure when Christmas wreaths got going. Tanya Gulovich in her book on the Encyclopedia of Christmas and New Year's doesn't really mention uh, the actual you know, origin of the Christmas wreaths because they just show up, like starting with like the revitalization, revitalization of Christmas. I mean, it's an old Irish custom. She notes it's an old German custom. It's just a custom in so many cultures. It'd be like getting mad uh, that Christians may eat ham or roast beef on christmas because ancient pagans had festivals where they would have beef or ham oh no well that must mean they must have got it from pagan no humans just like to eat and like they're going to eat a lot of the same types of foods yeah yeah if that logic applied jews would be in a lot of pro jews would have a lot of issues when it comes to wine because like dionysus was the god of wine but now we can't have wine that would disrupt a lot of our uh, religious practice there 
so another Hebrew Roots uh, YouTube channel organization, 119 Ministries, came out with a documentary a couple of years ago where they interview scholars and people arguing that Christmas is pagan. And I was wondering um, if you watched that and if you have any thoughts on it. Yeah, I saw that. And I think I got like 30 minutes in and had just a list of errors they had made in there. And it, it was so bad. At one point, they say like that Holly was a symbol of the god Saturn. So I say with Saturnalia. Well, that's just nonsense. It, <laughs> Holly was a weed. It is a weed. And Saturn was an agricultural god. I, that, that's like a fertility goddess symbol being like celibacy or something, or like a monk that's celibate. It doesn't make sense. I, you're not going to have an agricultural god and their symbol be a weed. Like that wouldn't, that, that, I don't even know where they got that from. Uh, you know, his actual symbol was like, like a sickle for cutting down grain or grain itself. It wasn't actually, and I cannot find no historians that make this claim. They, they do have some historians in it, but they get a lot of things wrong. They try to connect mistletoe to like fertility uh, among humans and whatnot. What they don't know the origins of mistletoe. Like mistletoe sort of comes and enters the Christmas tradition in the 1600s as a decoration in Britain. Well, because, you know, there's not a lot of color in winter, but luckily there is this one plant that you have a little bit of red in. Sure, add it in. The kissing under the mistletoe tradition doesn't come until a couple hundred years later among the serving class in Britain. The only, there's a couple, there's like really only one or maybe a couple other, but ancient source, it's Pliny the Elder that mentions mistletoe in association with paganism. But a lot of these people don't really go into a lot of the history on it. Pliny says the Gauls in France thought mistletoe was sacred if they found it on an oak tree and they thought it could cure animal infertility and cure poison. They don't connect it to with a winter festival, winter celebration, anything like that. And it has to be on an oak tree. And then it's only sacred. And it can be found any time during the year. So, I mean, that's just one of the problems of the many in the Christmas tradition. Of course, or the Christmas question, that documentary. Of course, they try to connect it to Saturnalia and all this other crap. And it's just really bad reasoning. I'd love to debate one of the makers of the, that documentary because it'd be so easy to just take apart their claims and show there's just no sources for this. Yeah. That's what I really respect about your channel because you always cite the primary sources or the scholars that you're quoting and, and you don't always find that on, on YouTube. Yeah, and people need to do that more. And yeah. just because there's a documentary that says that Holly was a symbol of Saturn, don't believe, look it up. I mean, just, yeah. and just use some reasoning. He was an agricultural being. Was he really you know, having a weed as a symbol? No, that's, that's ridiculous. Okay, so my last question uh, to close this is during a time when numerous followers of Jesus and people in general so easily accept conspiracy theories, what is your advice for those people to think more rationally and critically about something like if you celebrate Christmas, you're participating in paganism? Sometimes it's hard to get through to these people because they are so dogmatic in their assertions about this and they think they are they think if they even consider the thought that it's not pagan, they're, they're somehow sinning and whatnot because they are so convinced that it is pagan and you got to abstain from anything related to pagans, which of course is, is not biblical as we've already discussed so far. But you, the best thing to do in a lot of these conversations is just keep asking for their evidence. Ask them, where are they getting this from? Do they, did they actually read historians? Do they have primary sources? Get them to start thinking about the actual evidence for this, and then you can slowly start to erode away the, the utter nonsense and show them the problem with it. And also just start asking them to think logically about it. Like Acts 17 is a great example of where Paul quotes pagan literature and reclaims it for Christ. Why can't Christmas, even if it was pagan, be something like that? Let's, let's use it for good. Well, what's wrong with that? I mean, Paul did that. Uh, so, uh, Solomon did that with the Proverbs and whatnot. So, I mean, that, that's the way you got to kind of get to them. Sh ask them, start to erode away the historical aspect, and then also try to get them to think more logically about it and what actually is in Scripture. A lot of these people, in my view, it, it come from the conspiracy theory mentality. I call it the Matrix Syndrome, where it's really cool to be a part of this rebellious underground movement that really knows the truth. And the majority of people just can't see because they're blinded by, you know, the, the flash and, the, and the, the glare of modern society. So, you know, it, it, it just seems really kind of cool to be a part of that underground movement that knows the truth. Uh, 
recognize what that actually is. I mean, and actually try to actually make sure your beliefs are based on evidence, not on wanting to be a part of a, a niche or some part of club or some sort of special movement. I don't think a lot of people are doing that intentionally. I think it's a subconscious mentality, but try to recognize that that could be the case if you think Christmas is pagan and actually try to study the evidence. That's really helpful. Really appreciate that. And thank you for coming on uh, to Messy Andrews. Really appreciate your time, Michael. So thank you. Yeah, um, thanks for having me. I'm glad to come on anytime. Thanks for joining us today for this important conversation. If you're interested in looking into these issues further, we encourage you to subscribe to Michael's channel, Inspiring Philosophy. He has a new video answering objections to Christmas coming out, and you can watch his debates on this topic. Inspiring Philosophy is a fantastic channel that explores many topics that we don't cover on our channel, such as arguments for the existence of God, the soul, understanding and defending Genesis, and much more. So definitely check out his channel. If you enjoyed this video or learned something new, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can be notified when our next video comes out. Let us know what you think in the comments, whether you agree or whether you disagree with Michael that Christmas is not pagan. We think he's right and we really wanna hear what you think. Thanks for joining us and see you next time.